Become Voices, the program that this is part of, is closing on its third season. Every episode, every season has ten episodes, has three segments, and we cover all the barrio throughout the country, parades, we have two or three parades. Some of the parades uh, are in a loop down there in, the, uh, in a monitor where the fair is going to be, and some other content that you may want to check out. Now, the question is, since April, a lot has happened. So what I will try to do uh, uh, right now is to, uh, that's the, the address for, for where the video is. What I will try to do is bring, up, uh, bring you up, up to speed a little bit in terms of, of where we are. The presentation is divided into two parts, uh, Puerto Rico first, what's happening there, and then the impact on Puerto Ricans in the States, and a little bit of how we have reacted. So a lot of these things is, is uh, uh, the first time that I present them, so uh, I, if I digress, just tell me to stay on point. I appreciate that. In any case, uh, the, everybody knows by now, and the clip uh, showed uh, very clearly, that Puerto Rico is, is going not just an economic crisis, uh, a fiscal a crisis, but also a political and humanitarian crisis. The humanitarian crisis has received a little bit of attention, but not the political crisis. And I think all of those dimensions are important, and um, today more than ever, all those three uh, dimensions are interacting to define the Puerto Rico of today. Uh, this decline in social conditions is very important, very impactful, as some of the speakers in the video show. And more importantly, close to half a million Puerto Ricans, if you fast forward to 2015 and what's going on now, have left the island over the last decade. That's a lot of people. I will show you how many of those uh, uh, in a minute. Having said that, uh, uh, in reaction to the situation in Puerto Rico, Congress acted. We lobbied for Congress to act, and Congress acted. We won that one. However, we didn't quite win the, what they did in Puerto Rico. So what they did was to enact uh, a bill, PROMESA, that established uh, an, an oversight board uh, which is nothing more than a colonial uh, junta, and there should be no doubt about that. And the trade-off, and why so, some of our elected officials supported uh, with a vote on that bill, is because the technical war is they screwed up. Then the question is, what do we do now? How, how they can sustain an economy where there is no financial uh, gap financing available to them? And obviously, uh, the, the, the big idea from the governor was to uh, the U.S. government to uh, continue increasing the subsidization that they have sustained for some time. And now you heard what happened in the last elections, you can uh, reach your own conclusions about that. Uh, the, the oversight board has legal powers that supersede local laws. That's very important, with respect to the budget. Not with respect to the thing, but with respect to the budgets. Uh, and they oversee all contracts of $100,000 or more. Uh, so, um, they also, the law also established uh, uh, a task force that will examine long-term economic growth. Uh, they will examine some of the key uh, aspects of the economic crisis in Puerto Rico, including healthcare, as you know, we're, we're facing a, a Medicare a cliff uh, coming up uh, in 2017, where the blood grant that, that Obamacare enacted in 2010 will expire. It was a blood grant of about 5.2 billion that will expire, and that will affect about three quarters of the people that receive health services in Puerto Rico. If no funding is uh, supported, that's going to aggravate the whole economy, not just the people that receive, you know, the, especially the poor and the more, um, the, the more vulnerable populations. They also mandate to revitalize energy and infrastructure. As you know, Puerto Rico has the highest cost in energy of any uh, comparable island, even Hawaii, uh, in, in, within the U.S. system. And the public pensions uh, are in great, um, in, in great need of reform. They have enough money, they have enough assets for a couple of years. Afterwards, the government will have to fund it directly from ongoing revenues. That means that they have depleted all the assets. Everyone who's retiring, and there are a few of us who are close to that, you know, you know how important it is to keep your assets so that you can carry over when you retire. So the government, for more than two decades, have not funded that retirement appropriately. 
they use it as a sludge fund to balance the budget, in addition to borrowing. Now, you talked about an inept political class. This is an example of that. In any case, they have to file a report by December 31st, and we're waiting for that. And all of us submitted uh, recommendations as to what should do, be done in Puerto Rico, but um, we will see what they have to say about that. Um, so what has been the reaction in Puerto Rico to the law? It has been uh, what I will call a mixed bag. And, and you know, popular support has swing a little bit, and I will tell you where it is right now. Uh, the first thing that I should point, uh, Espacio Javierto, uh, the Central Roundtable, and other people that are watching what PROMESA is doing, uh, we all agree that there is very little knowledge about what the law actually do, one way or the other. People just don't understand well what's, uh, what's happening. And one of the poor's prior to uh, the elections uh, has a 46% support. That has increased to 62% by the end of August. So, uh, uh, and it had implications for the elections, as I will say, that I will explain in a minute. Um, so, as I mentioned, Governor Garcia Padilla complied with what the law said. The first step, submitted a budget, and then walked away. The second step was for him to revise the budget according to the oversight board guidelines, and he walked away, so he left that in the hands of the new elected governor, uh, uh, Ricky Rosselló. So, as a result of all this, Puerto Rico has seen uh, a lot of protest. So I'm just, just going to share a couple of clips with you. The first clip uh, is about a camp that was established when the law was enacted from the federal, uh, federal uh, uh, building, and it has served as the sort of the hub for coordinating the opposition to, uh, to uh, the law in Puerto Rico. Uh, they organized uh, the first conference that was organized by the Chamber of Commerce on PROMESA. They, uh, uh, you know, engaged in civic disobedience and uh, civil disobedience, and they stopped the conference. Uh, but having said that, uh, having said that, the, the most recent poll, as recent as August 18th of this year, right before the elections, important to keep it in mind had overwhelming support for La, for La Junta de Control Fiscal. Now, you may want to ask, why is that? Well, partly it's because people don't really know what it is, but I will give more credit to the, to the people in Puerto Rico, okay? There are a lot of them that are not confused. They know exactly what's going on, and what I think it explains is, but you can see that most of the support are, for, are for, uh, from the PNP, who actually won the elections in Puerto Rico, although PPD and other non, you know, independent people also, also more than 50% or close to 60% supported <coughs> the legislation. So mixed, mixed, mixed support in Puerto Rico, okay? You have on the one hand and you have on the other hand. What's going on behind this? In a, in a poll that was conducted by uh, researchers in Universidad de Turao, they found out that Puerto Ricans, for the most part, have overwhelming support for federal institutions. They trust them. The FBI, the Supreme Court, and right behind that, the Oversight Board. Okay, so this is not an isolated issue that, you know, Puerto Ricans are confused about uh, what, the, what, what the American uh, governing of Puerto Rico means. They, they support it. Just like if you do a poll on citizenship, I will tell you a vast majority of Puerto Ricans, overwhelming majority of Puerto Ricans, as a matter of fact, will support it. Central actually organized a conference on citizenship. We're coming out with a special issue. And I assure you that if you, if you say we're going to take citizenship away from uh, Puerto Ricans, no one is going to support a status issue that implies that. I can, I can tell you that. So what is the problem? That Puerto Ricans distrust the political leaders in Puerto Rico. This is just white distrust. And it's not just one party or the other party. The, the, the polls reveal that 95% of Puerto Ricans distrust, distrust their political leadership. And that's very significant. It is, it is shown in the recent elections. Okay? If you look at the results, uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, fact that the the party, the new progressive party that won, won with 42% of the vote, right? So in reality, the rest of the opposition, even if you discard the marginal uh, Partido por los Trabajadores, you have 57.8% of people supporting something else, right? 
But listen to this. Look at the, law, at the last two columns, right? Participation rate that in Puerto Rico always is around 80%, right? Look where it is, 55%, okay? So people voted with their feet. They are disgusted with the political process in Puerto Rico. Now, you may say, oh, this is so terrible. I don't think it's terrible. I think the people are moving towards they want to go. And I have to say that when you look at the, the, uh, the, the new progressive party, uh, they're claiming a, a mandate to govern just, uh, you know, like all the parties have done in the past. But when you look at, at the reality is that, I'm sorry, uh, the, 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 governing, the party that won has 23% of the total vote if you count the people that didn't vote, 23%. They're governing with 23%. Is that a mandate? You tell me if there's a mandate or not. But the second point is that if you add all the other votes, 57.8%, okay, supported something else. So the basis for a coalition moving forward are there. Are they going to, the recent uh, defeated political, Partido Democrático Popular, are they gonna take the leadership in redefining this? Hey, you tell me, if they, if the, sort of, there is, the basis for the coalition is there. Are they gonna take opportunity for this? So I don't know what the answer to that is. But it's a very interesting moment. It's a sad moment, but it's full of potential moving forward. The basis for a coalition are there. By the way, the two candidates for the PIP were elected too, with about 10% of the vote, uh, to the La Cámara y el Senado, to the Senate and to the House of Representatives. So if you add all these all this votes, of people that were not supporting the current party, even though they have majority. They don't have super majority, but they have majority in both houses. The potential, and Yulina already called, the, the, the uh, Alcalde de San Juan, she already called for uh, revisiting what the foundation for moving forward are. It's a great potential, okay. But this is where we are. It's a big question mark. Interesting, challenging. So what do we do, okay? That's where we fit in. What's happening there happens there. And I know in this room, there are gonna be at least 10 different opinions about what we should do moving forward, okay? My challenge to you is to leave the differences away. Put them away, park them away, and focus on what we need to do for unity. Thank you. So, uh, so why does it matter to us? Well, the first thing that I need to say is that this impact of the migration has reshaped the diaspora. We're not what we were 10 years ago. We have changed in significant and meaningful ways, okay? Uh, for one, look what happened in Florida. We have about equal number of Puerto Ricans in New York as we have in Florida. Political representation is in New York is about 40 plus elected officials. We have uh, three, uh, two Congress people, right? And now we have three, if you count Spayan, who has been with us every step of the way, the Dominican guy who won from the, from East Harlem, okay? So, okay, Florida just elected their first representative, Darren Soto, okay? But there is more to come. All the counselors in, in Kissimmee are Puerto Ricans, all of them. Okay, so, you know, all of them. We're, you know, we're moving forward with the institutional building in Florida that we went in, through in New York back in, in, in a few decades back, okay? When Monserrate was around, Carrera Valentin was around, Vélez was around, those were fun days. In any case, the other thing that implies is that Puerto Ricans are more dispersed today than ever, okay? More dispersed than ever. Um, and, and why is that? Um, you know, look at this graphic. Those are different measures of migration. But the recent migration, whether you measure by net balance of passengers, the blue line is the only one that we have reliable data, is a so-called demographic equation, or the, or the uh, green one, which is the actual census data for migration, what is this graphic telling you? That the current migration is as deep, right, as the one that we had back in, in the 50s, okay, that brought the Puerto Rican community to New York and to other parts of the country. It's so one big difference though. We haven't seen the end yet, okay? This is gonna continue. And I, I, you know, I, I don't wanna go on, on demographic projections, but as long as the economy in Puerto Rico sucks, people are gonna leave the island. They are young, 
they're educated, and, they're no, and they may not go back unless there are opportunities there for them to go back. So uh, what are the states who, that are, have benefited the most from this? Well, Florida obviously has the highest net balance of flow, but look who's second. Pennsylvania, not New York. People in New York are going to the suburbs, they're going to, uh, including New Jersey and Connecticut, by the way, those are our, sort of our suburbs. The New South is growing, and Massachusetts, Texas, Connecticut, they all have the impact of net migration going to, to their cities. And the, this is the other graphic that is interesting. I have two graphics about this. That because of the high rates of interstate mobility, Puerto Ricans are going from one place to the other. This is kind of a, uh, what's the technical word? You remember? Um jeguero, right? I mean, we're, we're a nomadic population, and, and, and people are going after jobs. This is all part of what I will call resiliency. People doing what they need to do to su support their families, support themselves, advance their careers, and so on. But it's interesting that it's not just to Florida, right, and the so-called new enclaves of the South, but it's also within the old enclaves, right? And from Florida, they have arrows coming back to New York and vice versa. So it's all over the place. So um, how do we understand this? It has to do with Puerto Ricans uh, seeking opportunities wherever they are. Okay, they look for jobs, whatever they are, they improve their, their skills and employability, they in, implement more strategies to be competitive in the job market, and one uh, of those is moving to get a job, and they do that frequently. How does this stand with the notion que los Puerto Ricanos son malos? Okay, por favor. La, the next time you hear someone saying that, don't punch them, but come close to it, okay? Just, just, just be adamant that this is not something that we can tolerate people saying, okay? So uh, I understand we need to support the poor, but do not let people tell you that we're not seeking work, and that we're not seeking jobs, okay? So what does it mean for us? Well, uh, it gives us a challenge to welcome these people in our communities. Central Florida, the issue is bilingual education. In Connecticut, it's something else. In New York, it's something else. Uh, you know, families in, in Pennsylvania. But the point is that all this dispersion, mobility, impact, net migration is affecting our communities. You know, I, I'm looking at NILDA. APM, Asociación Puerto Ricana Marcha in Philadelphia, pledged, their board pledged, to support every family that walked through their door. Okay, that's what stepping up means at the community level. They pledged to support each and every person that walked through their door to provide services, especially family support services. Mm -hmm. And that's what our community is doing right now. So we also have the opportunity to affect, uh, to affect change positively. Uh, and, and I think one of the challenges that we have is how can we strengthen our political muscle? How can we work together towards making a more assertive uh, statements, uh, having a, a more unified voice when it comes to issues of Puerto Rico. And I know the challenges, believe me. Uh, but there are, you know, there is a growing diaspora solidarity movement. And I'm going to explain what that is. But this diaspora solidarity movement is not just with Puerto Rico, okay? Do not be mistaken. Just look around when we go for a, a convening on parades and festival, people show up because they are concerned about what is it that we can do here and now, not just to support Puerto Rico, but to support our community and the challenges that we have, okay? So there are over 200 stateside uh, organizations that we have counted have Puerto Rico or Puerto Ricans in their name, in their mission, that's the core of what they do. There are another 100 that serve Puerto Ricans, Hispanic Federation New York and you know, many others that, uh, that, that serve Puerto Ricans and are close to our agenda. And there are about 150 state and local elected officials, okay? That's a lot of institutional uh, foundation for us. People keep saying, right? People keep saying that the problem is that Puerto Ricans are not organized. Let's challenge that myth. Puerto Ricans are highly organized. Look at this. Puerto Ricans are highly organized. Hey, we're lacking a little bit of coordination, okay? <laughs> Sometimes we pull in 10 different directions. But the potential for a unified voice 
even counting on differences, because you can't dismiss those, and right here I know we have differences of opinion, okay, I bet that we can put together a more effective action network, especially for parades and festivals. That's the goal today. Um, so, uh, so what are the dimensions that we need to examine? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we need to ex examine uh, how do we build more political power, how do we use our purchasing power, and how do we, how we tap into the cultural uh, capital that we already have, okay? So, uh, first, in terms of the, of the, of the political dimension, uh, you know, we are in a situation where we can affect the, co the decisions that Congress makes, okay? We vote, uh, we have Congress people, and in Puerto Rico, they participate in primaries, but they don't have representative and they don't vote. Now, we are not going to agree 100% with what might be the agenda in Puerto Rico, but we definitely can have exert pressure to Congress in terms of the decisions they make about Puerto Rico. Okay? Uh, and we have made a difference at the local elections. We obviously uh, probably increase our mobilization in Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Uh, whether we got the results that some of our leaders were seeking is a different question, but we did increase registration. We have a dismal participation rate of 50% across the board in presidential elections. I bet you that when the numbers start coming in, Puerto Ricans are difficult to measure because the samples are you know, dismal at the national level, but when the numbers start coming in, and we, and we have a better handle on that, I bet you that we improve on the 50%. I bet you. And one of those places where we really have uh, increased uh, our presence is Florida. As I mentioned, we elected uh, uh, Darren and, and, you know, Kissimmee, all the counselors and so forth. So, so I know that we made a difference at the local level. Okay? But look at the purchasing power of Puerto Ricans. Look at the purchasing power of New York. So of the total $137 billion, that is the income, the personal income of our community, how much of that is in Puerto Rico? 28%. Where is the majority of the money? It's with us. And every parade and every festival can tap into it. We need better coordination with, uh, with the Trace Association in Puerto Rico. We need better coordination. We need to bring them. They need to bring us down there. We need to do more trade fairs where we exchange. We exchange not just products, promotion, but we exchange cultural activism. We exchange ideas, right? So there's great potential, and there's money. And the money is here, not there, it's here. Okay, they have the rules, they, have, you know, they can help a lot, but whether they're gonna do that, I don't know. But look at this, there, we counted, and they're probably missing a few. You, you're gonna tell us how many we're missing. But we counted 55 parades and festivals throughout the country. 15 of uh, 14 states, okay? That's a lot of infrastructure in this field, a lot of infrastructure. Can we do better coordination? I mean, por favor. Uh, so, uh, there's something to do. But there is also sort of a, a solidarity movement building coalition, okay? I can mention the National Puerto Rican Agenda. I see a lot of their leaders uh, here today. They are organized in 10 states. Uh, uh, they're participating in many local campaigns, the, the Oscar Lopez campaign. They're, you know, they're, they're really making an effort to organize the diaspora where they are. La Copra with the women, uh, Aspira with the youth, El Puente with the environment, the youth. And, you know, we meet people where they are. The infrastructure is there. We just need to talk, coordinate, convene, and, and hopefully good things will come out of it. The caucus of elected officials has, has mobilized close to 60 or 70 people at any given time. They have met two or three times. Uh, the Puerto Rican Day Parade did a, 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 a sort of a, a voter registration, and they have raised issues of uh, gender equality, uh, of Carl Lopez, health crisis. In Puerto Rico, we marched with uh, Somos people uh, on the health campaign. So there is something there. People are acting, okay? Again, I'm just saying, people are acting. And they are all regional organizations that are very strong, 25 years old, uh, Chicago, Puerto Rican Agenda in, in Illinois. There are some new that just emerged as a result of the crisis. Pennsylvania for Puerto Rico is one, Hilda is here, and Roberto is here too, Roberto Hugo is here. Uh, Iniciativa Boricua from Florida, 
Alianza for Puerto Rico, and these are just a handful of them. We counted more than 50 of them, okay? 50 people who are active. Chapters of uh, Vamos por Puerto Rico, chapter for No Puerto Rican Parade, active in, uh, when we went to December 11th to the Capitol, when we were doing voter registration, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so, uh, so what is the role of Centro? So we have tried to convene the community with uh, a non-partisan perspective, with a non, uh, you know, we try to bring everybody together. Everybody has the same voice, has same equal voice. We organized uh, an Encuentro, LGBT Encuentro in June. We did a very successful New England Encuentro. I see a few of our, our friends here. Uh, we're doing this today, and next semester, next year, we're gonna go to Florida. We have some local people that are putting together the, the host committee. Uh, and we're planning uh, a youth uh, summit. And tonight we're gonna have the second regional meeting. We had one in New England a couple of months ago. And I hope some of you will participate. Any organization with a youth component should come. That will determine the agenda and we'll, I will uh, update you on what we are on that. And hopefully sometime in the summer we have a national summit of youth, if we could. Otherwise we just do some uh, regional summits. So we're moving and sometime next year as soon as we can secure a little funding, we will organize a second uh, conference of the one we had in April. May not be in April, maybe a little farther because I need a little time to work this out. But it will happen at some point. Uh, so uh, Centro also put together a round table. Uh, this is more of a watchdog sort of uh, a group. It's all volunteers. We have restructuring experts, we have economists, we have people who can actually monitor what PROMESA is intended to do. We have energy experts, and we issue uh, some policy statements to the Congressional Task Force. Uh, we respond to newspaper questions about it. We help put together a PROMESA panel in Somos in Puerto Rico not long ago. Uh, in any case, we Centro is trying to uh, to provide, think about it in terms of the consumer report of PROMESA, okay, as I just did. The every, I present all the data. You guys make up your own mind as to the conclusions that, that you should make. We just present the data. You guys can figure it out. We, uh, we give you that much credit, okay? So, um, so we're working on monitoring that. Uh, so in conclusion, the, all this that is happening in Puerto Rico has awakened the Puerto Rican diaspora, has awakened it in, in very positive ways. It presents a lot of challenges, but I think the, the moment, the historical moment that we live, the diaspora is responding with a historical response. If, you, if we do not understand that, we do not understand what's going on, okay? So it's in our hands, really, to move towards more uh, political empowerment, economic progress for our community, for all nine million of us, here and there. And I think I'm gonna stop with that because I have Giselle <coughs> sort of telling me to shut up. But in any case, uh, you know, the, the impact that we're having with the economic crisis, we're responding to the challenge. And all I wanna leave you with, it is time for action. Gracias.